On this edition of Defense News Weekly, see the first flight of a new surveillance aircraft, learn about short-range air defense, hear about the future of directed energy, and we'll discuss the state of the defense industry with in-depth interviews, up-close video, and leading analysis. This is Defense News Weekly. Welcome to this week's edition of Defense News Weekly. I'm Jeff Martin. The Army says they will choose their interim short-range air defense solution by the end of this year. The program, designed to close what Army leaders have called a critical gap, will replace Cold War era Avenger vehicles. And regardless of what launcher is selected, the Army has said it will be mounted on a striker vehicle. While the Army hasn't said who the leaders are, it has said there are two viable candidates. Some of the competitors include Boeing and General Dynamics, Raytheon and Raphael. The Army says the goal is to deploy the first of the new equipment to Europe by 2021. Both the U.S. and South Korea say they'll resume combined exercises like Full Eagle and Key Resolve in Korea. They were suspended for the Winter Olympic Games. The exercises, which normally cause major tension with North Korea, come as the North is reportedly preparing to begin negotiation with the U.S. and South Korea over the rogue country's nuclear program. But this year, the North has been remarkably quiet about the annual maneuvers which it normally describes as a rehearsal to invade from the South. In other news from South Korea, sources have told Defense News that the Asian country plans to buy more AH-64 Apache attack helicopters as part of a strategic shift within the Korean military. Existing strategy calls for the Korean military to withstand a North Korean attack and then counterattack when U.S. troops arrive. But the possible Apache buy is the first part of a plan to rapidly advance into North Korea in case of war. Under that strategy, the South Koreans could occupy Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, in two to three weeks. In 2007, Syria's only nuclear reactor mysteriously blew up. Since then, many have suggested that Israel conducted an airstrike, but they've always denied it. Until now. In this declassified video, taken from an Israeli aircraft, you can see the reactor, located in a ravine in northeastern Syria, being destroyed by a strike from eight aircraft. Israel's Air Force chief, who planned the raid, says the strike not only blocked the Assad government from getting nuclear weapons, but also stopped the Islamic State from acquiring them as well. You can read more about the daring raid and why Israel decided to strike at defensenews.com. Buying an aircraft carrier is expensive, but if the Navy buys two of them at a time, it could save a lot of money. While the Navy hasn't said exactly how much they could save, so-called block buys like this often save upwards of 15% of the total cost. The potential of a two-carrier buy has been in the news for a while, and the Navy hopes to have an agreement with shipbuilder Huntington Ingalls by the end of the year. The deal would cover two carriers of the Gerald Ford class, CVN-80, which would be the USS Enterprise, and the unnamed CVN-81. And this isn't the first time the Navy has done this, as the Nimitz class was bought using similar agreements. Check out this video of Saab's new globalized surveillance aircraft flying for the first time. The aircraft is designed to provide airborne early warning and is based on a Bombardier Global 6000 business jet. It includes a large detection radar as well as maritime search capability. As of now, the United Arab Emirates is the prime customer and have ordered three of the aircraft. Military leaders continue to pay visits to Capitol Hill to discuss the 2019 budget request and the recent nuclear posture review. Here's a look at some highlights. We are at the edge of the techn technological frontier for our nation. The future that the next director will face presents challenges and opportunities from rapid technological evolution, including machine learning, artificial intelligence, and quantum computing, as well as the growing capabilities of the technological industry. Last week, the President of the United States said that the new national defense strategy for space recognizes that space is a warfighting domain. I don't remember any president ever openly saying that. He has relaunched the National Space Council under the leadership of Vice President Pence. And nowhere is his leadership more clear than in the president's budget. And this year's budget accelerates our ability to deter and defend and protect our ability to operate uh, and to win in space. Both Russia and China are aggressively pursuing hypersonic If that happens, uh, what kind of defense do we have against hypersonic right? Uh, we have a very difficult, well, our defense is our deterrent capability. Uh, we don't have a, any defense that could uh, deny the em employment of such a weapon against us. So our response would be our deterrent force, which would be the triad 
and the nuclear capabilities that we have to respond to such a threat. People come over from the Pentagon and tell us all kinds of horror stories about what they don't have, about how short they are, about their unfunded requirements, about all the money that they need that they don't have, and how that lack of money is going to lead to one cataclysm after another. Um, and I don't discount the, the threat environment that the chairman just described. But if we're going to get to good on that stuff, it can't all be up, 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 up. Um, there's got to be some place in a $700 billion budget where you're going, gosh, you know, I wish I didn't have to spend that money because I'd like to spend it over here. Uh, I think that one of the areas that, that I need help in that I don't have uh, is persistent uh, ISR, uh, Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance, so I can keep eyes on, an unblinking eye uh, on North Korea, which we do not have today. You've heard me speak before what CR has cost the uh, United States Navy since they began, about $4 billion uh, burned in a trash can. We saw, too, Boeing reported the KC-46A program had two Category 1 deficiency reports, one in the remote vision system and the other in the centerline drogue system. Um, are these deficiencies behind the Air Force's report last week that they're going to revise the timeline for first delivery? And if not, tell me the impact of these deficiencies. Boeing is still saying they're going to deliver on time, the Air Force changing the timelines. Can you give us a perspective on where things are? Yes, sir. Boeing is saying that they're going to deliver in the second quarter of 18. The Air Force thinks it's more likely to be late 18. And Boeing has been uh, overly optimistic in all of their scheduled reports. To keep up to date with all of our coverage, be sure to visit our Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn pages. Also, be sure to add us on Apple News and other platforms for the latest updates. And when we come back, see the future of laser weapons and a look at a military UFC fighter. Today's program is provided in part by Raytheon, proud partner of FifthDomain.com, the sister site of Defense News, dedicated to all things cyber. Learn more at FifthDomain.com. The Department of Defense is constantly researching new forms of weaponry, both lethal and otherwise. And some of those potentially lethal technologies include lasers, both lethal and non-lethal. Military Times ground combat reporter Todd South attended the Pentagon's Directed Energy Exhibition this week to learn more. So we're here today at the Pentagon and we're looking at the lethal and non-lethal directed energy programs. I mean, to the layman, it's their lasers, basically. And behind me, you see some VA systems uh, mock-ups and models of their different stuff. Everything from uh, an electromagnetic railgun, which has been talked about for years, uh, to a hyper-velocity projectile, basically making a single projectile in an existing system way faster than what we have now and just as capable and just as accurate or more than the new munitions we have now, so they don't have to build a whole new gun. You also have a high-powered microwave unit. Um, it's really for counter UAS and the counter drone swarms, basically knocking out entire swarms of drones, almost like a, a bug zapper with mosquitoes. And you also got the, um, the 25 millimeter small unit uh, tactical laser system. It has a 30 to 60 kilowatt laser. You can integrate right into the existing systems on a ship, no extra space, no extra requirements, and it can knock down threats such as uh, small unmanned drones. It can shoot lasers that way to disable them, kind of mess up their insides and deflect that, that, that threat. Another item here that would be of key use and interest to our ground troops is the High Energy Laser Mobility Tactical Test Truck. Basically, they're taking what they have now out in the field, a 5 kilowatt laser, which can take out a small drone, kind of melt that little plastic drone. They're ramping up that power to about 60 kilowatts. This truck would be would essentially be able to take out uh, rockets, artillery, and mortars um, as they're coming in or before they even you know, really get into the launch phase um, once they've left their target. So if you're sitting there, you got a forward base, and those, those things are a threat or some kind of radar notifies that they're coming in, you can melt those things in the sky before they even reach you or cause any kind of harm. Um, still in testing phase, not quite to fielding, but looks pretty promising according to a lot of the scientists here. So now we're going to look at something that's quite a bit smaller and a lot different than what you've seen today. So we hear a lot about lasers and, and different kinds of ways of disrupting technologies like taking down drones by like, interrupting with their signal. But what we see behind us is a silent saber system. It's basically actual heat is going out and going to melt through something, be it you know, metal or plastic or just causing enough heat to uh, cause something to shut down. Um, now, people immediately think about drones, um, but we have weapons for that. They basically disrupt the, the drone. This could do that while also melting it. Um, this could also simultaneously work on a, on a landmine or an IED just a few hundred meters out, providing immediate heat just to melt that object or maybe even cause it to detonate. It's, it's getting into development. It's showing that a single individual soldier or marine could carry that capability out and take out these kind of threats with heat rather than just a disruption of signal because there's all kinds of ways to disrupt signal. There's not a lot of ways to put heat on target at those kind of ranges. 
we saw a host of different devices and concepts today, all involving lethal and non-lethal use of directed energy or lasers. From a heat cannon you can strap to your M4 to take out drones or IEDs, to uh, you know, lasers mounted on big trucks, to ships, to even futuristic plasma that could shoot to a person and, and kind of talk to it, almost something out of a sci-fi movie. Um, so there's a lot going on in the Department of Defense when it comes to lasers, and a lot of interesting things down the pipe, a lot of things out in the field right now. Uh, signing off, this is Todd South from Military Times. Defense companies buying other companies is certainly nothing new, but bidding wars are rare. So I talked to Defense News Executive Editor Jill Itoro this week about one that's going on right now. So Jill, now that we have a bidding war for CSRA between two different companies, walk me through how we got here and where we kind of stand with this possible takeover of this company. Yeah, so basically what happened a number of weeks ago is that General Dynamics put in a bid for CSRA. CSRA is uh, basically spun off from CSC as its government business even longer ago. Mm -hmm. So they bid for that. It was a very lucrative uh, bid in terms of the total value and everyone was quite surprised by it, saw it moving along. What we just found out recently is that CACI mm -hmm. decided to come in and make its own bid exceeding what General Dynamics had offered. So you might call it a bidding war um, in this sense. Mm -hmm. um, CSRA has remained relatively quiet. Everyone's kind of now sitting back and seeing what will come of the situation in terms of who will win out in this scenario. But General Dynamics has said they're moving forward with approvals. So could CSRA go, you know what, we want a little more money for ourselves and, and jump to CICI on this? They could. And, you know, everyone's throwing away the term of hostile takeover. But from the perspective of CSRA, mm -hmm. um, you know, they are getting a deal, an offer for more money. So whether they are saying as much or not, I have to imagine there's an evaluation going on in, in, uh, in that proposal. Now a lot falls into acquisition in terms of what makes some, something appealing. So there's much happening behind the scenes, no doubt. But what comes of it, you know, we, we just don't know. It was very unusual. These are all major players. It's also interesting because General Dynamics, generally we think of in terms of defense. Mm -hmm. um, they're, you know, a front player in terms of the defense market. CSRA and CACI are very much leaders in IT services. And so they almost are more um, parallels in terms of those two companies. So even though the rationale for buying is different from a general dynamics that I think is looking to expand its portfolio with CSRA in certain areas, whereas CACI, there's some of that, but I think it's also a matter of growth and bolstering their power in, as an IT service provider to the government. So on the general dynamics side, you have a larger company who's bringing on a certain sector to bring it into its business, but with CSEI, it's taking over almost a competitor. To some degree. Now, general dynamics has its IT segment, mm -hmm. um, and I think it, this will bolster that segment, but it also has a lot, a lot of um, defense business that it also relies on. So it's more a matter of kind of balancing its business areas to some degree. CACI, it's just making it more of a giant in that space. And it does almost CACI, if they were to win out on this, it would position them differently against, for example, Alidos, which of mm -hmm. course bought the IT business from Lockheed Martin recently. Mm -hmm. So it's a lot in terms of size and um, breadth of IT market and ownership. Um, that would be coming from CACI. So it's a little different in terms of the rationale so, there. So in your mind, have, you've seen, you've looked at the industry, you've, you've had a lot of experience looking at the industry. Normally when a company says, hey, we're going to buy said company, it's off the market, so to speak. Yet in this case, it's not. So is this almost like a, an unwritten rule being broken here? Or? It's almost, and that's where everyone throws around the term of hostile. Um, I don't think the rule is being broken. Um, it's almost like an offer is being floated and it's, you know, hey, we're out here, we're willing to kind of play, play ball in terms of an acquisition that might be more appealing. And so with the whole industry, we've seen a lot of companies, mergers, acquisitions, where does that stand? And is it beneficial for DOD to have these companies merging and acquiring each other? It's funny because really what we saw for quite a while was a lull in M&A. And it's suddenly gained a little bit of traction over the course of the last couple years and so everyone is saying there's that you know there's a huge consolidation of the market I wouldn't actually say that's happening I think it's just back to having a healthy M&A landscape but we have some seen some big ones you have United Technologies mm -hmm. that um, is buying Rockwell Collins Northrop um, is buying Orbital ATK what's happening generally here is that they're expanding their portfolio they're enabling themselves to be competitive in new markets 
Um, the Defense Department is fine with that. Um, they like a healthy industrial base. Where they get a little nervous is where there's not enough competition and where these acquisitions do create a consolidation in the market where there's just not enough players for fair competition and to make sure that pricing is managed and kept at a reasonable rate. So that's where they step up and say, say this can no longer happen. I don't think we're there. Mm -hmm. I don't think the Defense Department thinks they're there, but they evaluate all of these various deals. And finally, as we close out, there's been a lot of news lately about executive pay. Senator Bernie Sanders has railed against, he's called government, he's called these contractors semi-government agencies, said that they should be paid, they're being paid far more than a cabinet secretary, for mm -hmm. example. What's your reaction to that? You know, um, we hear this, this, this erupts constantly, you know, as, as over the years. And the reality is, yes, the majority of these companies' business is from government. Mm -hmm. But these are publicly traded companies. So what you will hear on the industry side is that they need to compete for talent, not against government agencies, but against comparable public companies of their size. So the reality is that when they're paying a Maryland Houston at Lockheed Martin $20 million, much of it happening to be in stock, by mm -hmm. the way, um, that's that's competing against the market and ensuring they have the talent they need. It's just a reality in terms of publicly traded companies. It's, you know, you have to go with what the demand it's is. Just the, and that's just the state of the market. It's Thanks so much, Joe. We appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Coming up, we visit Walter Reed National Military Medical Center and learn about one UFC fighter working in the Pentagon. <music> on this week's Money Minute, personal finance expert Jeanette Mack offers her tips on buying a home in a tight market. If a new duty station is on your horizon, or you're just looking to move up from renting and you haven't been keeping tabs on the housing market in your area, you could be in for a surprise. According to the National Association of Realtors, the supply of homes for sale has been trending downward, meaning buyers in many markets are competing for a shrinking number of available homes. So before you start house shopping, you need to get your financing ship shape so you can act fast on your dream home. An experienced mortgage lender can help you understand your budget and get you pre-qualified for a loan. This is key since it makes you a more attractive buyer. And now is not the time to make major purchases or take on new debt. Low debt and financial stability give you an edge. Once you do find a home you love, work with your realtor to quickly make a good offer and be ready to negotiate if you have competition. It's wise not to offer more than you can afford just to land the house. There's another one out there for you. Just being prepared can be all the difference in the world for you and your new home. Thanks, Jeanette. We'll see you next week. To get more Defense News coverage, be sure to visit our website at defensenews.com and subscribe to our early bird brief, delivered to your inbox every weekday morning to get you ready to start the day. And when we come back, we'll visit a UFC fighter who works in the Pentagon. March 29th is National Vietnam War Veterans Day. And as part of that, the National Vietnam War Commemoration is working to honor Vietnam veterans across the United States. A big part of that is organizing events in every state and territory. And according to the commemoration's director, while the Vietnam War itself might be controversial, those that served shouldn't be. Warriors don't start wars. Warriors are required to fight them. The American people, I think, know today you've got to separate the warrior from the war. Uh, politicians make the decision. Leaders make that decision. What you want from your military is to go where they're sent and do the job they're told to do. Well, in the, 50, in the 60s and 70s, these veterans signed up and went, and most of them went as, as volunteers. And they served, and they served honorably. And therefore, that service to the nation is what's important. Something that's often forgotten about the Pentagon is that it's actually one of the world's largest office buildings, where more than 24,000 people file in every day. Among them is one active duty soldier who takes a bit of a different coffee break during his day. Military Times' Nicole Bakke has more. When it comes to his day job, Sergeant First Class Colton Smith has a pretty typical setup. So day to day, most of the time I'm in an office. I'm in an office setting just like this, uh, working the calendars for the SEAC as well as travel plans with people all over the world. He works in the office of Command Sergeant Major John Troxell, where he helps plan and handle his boss's trips and travel. I am his action officer and operations NCO. So what I do, action officer is the fancy title. Basically anything that comes down that's actionable, we need to work on any trips, I'll prepare the trip. I'll execute the trip, and then I'll close that trip out. But twice a day, Smith descends into the catacombs of the Pentagon, where he does something a little more exuberant. Oh. 
Along with being an active duty soldier, Smith is also a professional MMA fighter, a passion and talent he discovered while deployed to Baghdad in 2007. During the surge, outside of working out again, during our free time, there wasn't a whole lot to do but just dwell on what happened that day or uh, you know the atrocities we've seen in war. Uh, so I went to the, uh, the local market and I got some, uh, some UFC DVDs, DVD 1 through like UFC 40 or something. And I watched those on my little portable DVD player in my free time and uh, that kind of sparked my interest. I was like, you know what, I want to do this, I can do this. Uh, I got a punching bag from there, bought a punching bag from the local market downtown in Baghdad, uh, in Ghazalia. And I put it up in our, in our stairwell actually in the house that we took over in the middle of Baghdad, in Gaza, western Baghdad, in Ghazalia and uh, you know, started hitting the punching bag. And I told all my guys, I'm like, listen, I'm gonna be in UFC 150, you watch, you know, and they're all laughing, yeah, right. Well, turns out I was actually in UFC 160, so uh, it wasn't too far off from, from the prophecy that I had. Smith began pursuing his goal when he returned to the US in 2008 and immediately saw success. In 2012, Smith participated in and won season 16 of The Ultimate Fighter. So I'm the only soldier ever to fight while on active duty in the UFC. Um, uh, so I was in the UFC for over two years. I was in the Ultimate Fighter television series as well. And I'm the only one to ever do it while on active duty. Now Smith is training for his first fight in two years. He'll be facing off against Sean Brady in the Shogun fight for the welterweight title belt at the Seminole Hard Rock Hotel and Casino in Hollywood, Florida on March 17th. 11-0, guys never tasted defeat. Uh, full-time fighter, obviously we talked about it previously. I'm a full-time soldier. Colton's probably the most dedicated athlete that I've ever been involved with or been around. This fight is a three-round fight. He's been training for a five-round fight, and, that, and that's what's going to get his hand raised. Smith goes into every fight and training workout remembering his brothers and sisters in arms. I put a lot more pressure on my shoulders because I am representing so many men and women in uniform. And it pushes me harder to know, you know, I have all these service members, my subordinates, my peers, my leaders that are going to be watching me when I fight. And, in, you know, a lot of it, I feel the pressure that I need to go out there. I need to execute like they would a mini mission and accomplish that mission and defeat my opponent. And not only defeat my opponent, but put an exclamation point on it for them. From outside the cage, in the Pentagon Athletic Center, I'm Nicole Bauke. Advancements in military medicine have saved countless lives that might have been lost due to mishaps on and off duty. Some of those advancements include motion capture and augmented reality. And they're in use at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda. Dustin Diaz visited the hospital and talked to a sailor who was using this technology to get back to the life he once knew. This is the Computer Assisted Rehabilitation Environment, or Karen Lab. If it looks like a giant video game, that's because it essentially is one. I can program applications, so start from scratch and create anything that the clinicians want. And it's very neat to have mechanical, computer, and motion capture, all of these systems integrated together and working at the same time. There are only 10 Karen labs in the world. Got My Tan programs applications on this one designed to help physically rehabilitate injured service members. It does this with specialized cameras, augmented reality scenarios projected onto a massive high-definition curved display, and a motion platform with an embedded treadmill. They're usually very excited to work on the system, and he definitely has it. He has a, a background in, um, in gaming, and it's exciting for him to be able to incorporate that in his rehabilitation, and a lot of patients get that excitement out of it. Some service members refer to the Karen Lab are hurt in combat with traumatic brain injuries, amputations, or other grievous injuries. Others suffer non-combat injuries, like Petty Officer Jared Lenahan did four years ago. After I had deployed to Afghanistan, I went to Sicily. I was rock climbing with some friends on a weekend, and uh, some gear broke that wasn't supposed to, and I took a 50-foot drop outdoors straight to the ground. It was a bad fall. Broke three fingers on my right arm, two fingers on my left side, hip fib on my right leg, two toes on the left side, three toes on the right side, fractured two ribs, kidney laceration, liver laceration, a moderate traumatic brain injury, and I've got a rod on the left side of my leg as well. But he says it could have been worse. I probably shouldn't have my leg right now. I should also probably be dead right now. I've come a long way and I'm going to keep going. So. Jared is also seen in the adjacent gate lab, which is part of Walter Reed's Center for Performance and Clinical Research. This side of the house uses sophisticated motion analysis equipment to find exactly what an individual service member's problems are and how to address them. The left screen, that is Jared pre-Karen training. And as you can see from that, there's a lot of side-to-side -side motion. What you're seeing on the right screen, this is kind of a midpoint. He was able to do a fast walk, which is what's depicted on the screen, 
His gait is more fluid. He's definitely able to walk faster and he's eliminated that side to side motion. With the data from the Karen and Gate Labs, the help of Walter Reed's staff and diligent training, Jared plans to get back to the life that he used to know. Personally, my goal is just to get back to rock climbing 100%. Um, Dustin Diaz, Defense News Weekly. Before we go this week, we'd like to welcome a very special Marine recruit to the Corps, Chesty Poor the 15th. Chesty the 15th has entered training to replace Chesty the 14th at ceremonial Marine events. Welcome to the Corps, Chesty. Good luck in training. And that's all we have time for this week. But if you want to see and read more, be sure to head over to defensenews.com. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next week.